Welcome, everyone. My name is Michael Sherrill, and um, I'm here to introduce Marilyn Zaff today. I'm a maker, but I've been involved with the Center for Craft for, well, I served on the board for nine years and was board pre president for a while. For And so now I guess it's about 13 years or 14 years. The Center for Craft is uh, an organism that was born out of um, Handmade in America. You may have heard a little bit about that as a great sort of economic survey looking at the power of craft to change economically and civically in a community. And they track numbers that help people uh, form their funding or requests from the government and from other entities. And one of the things that happened in a think tank, like we hold now at the Center for Craft, was the idea of having a place where you could basically gather people together, institutions, colleges, further, you know, higher education, but also the makers and the people that are of influence inside that community together. And we've provided think tanks year after year. We also support Wingate fellowships for undergrads, uh, 10 of those uh, every year. And, so, and we also dabble and work, and Marilyn's going to talk about all this, and uh, supporting so much of the different arms of, of our community. And I think for me, being a part of Center for Craft was because I believe that we need a strong culture for emerging artists. And, and as you grow older, you try to pay back a little bit, and I feel like that's the main force of what we do, and, or what I see that we do. And I would love to introduce you now to Marilyn Zaft. <laughs> Marilyn is the Associate Director of the Center for Craft and Creativity and Design in Asheville, North Carolina. She's a, a trustee of the American Craft Council and recently curated a traveling show by Michael Sherrill. <laughs> And, and it's lovely, and she did a wonderful job. Um, she holds an MA in History and Design from the Royal College of Art, Victoria Albert Museum. May I introduce you to Marilyn Saft. Thanks, Michael. Um, and thank you to Ansika for inviting me to be here and to all of you for coming. I'm really glad that you're here. Thank you for joining us. Um, today I'm going to talk about um, a number of grant programs that the Center for Craft offers. Uh, a few in particular, though, focusing on maker opportunities. So that's really going to be the lens that I um, sort of curate this presentation through. Um, so I am going to talk for about uh, 15 to 20 minutes, and I'm going to leave a good amount of time at the end for questions so that we can have a good a uh, chance to answer sort of the burning questions that this presentation might bring up for you. Uh, I also wanted to mention, um, I do have this uh, sign-up sheet, and I'm going to actually have it passing around during the lecture. And, you know, if you want more information on these grants, honestly, the best thing to do is to sign up for our e-news, because that's where we're constantly posting application deadlines and new opportunities and all that kind of stuff. So if you want to stay kind of in the loop, I really encourage you to sign up. And uh, Katie's going to be passing that around, so that'll be happening on... Um, in tandem with the presentation. So I'm going to start by just telling you a little bit about the Center for Craft, because my guess is that not all of you have heard of who we are and what we do, because we're uh, a very nimble and efficient nonprofit that's been working for over 23 years. We're headquartered in Asheville, North Carolina, but we're a national nonprofit, so we really, really look at um, how do we advance the understanding of craft? That is one of our main focuses. We think about the field as the whole a lot. Uh, we talk a lot about field building. What does the craft field look like? What is the ecosystem? What is the relationship between uh, scholars and the people that write history of craft, of the curators and the people that mount exhibitions, not just the ceramics field, but also how does the ceramics ecosystem work with the jewelry field? And what does this whole thing look like as a whole? And what do we need as a like big C craft field to um, be relevant in our society today, to be valued in our society today? 
today. And one of, you know, we really focus, uh, we can't cover everything, obviously. So we really focus on funding new ideas, craft scholarship, and the next generation. Those are the areas that we want to invest in and we think are the keys to success for building this strong national craft field. So how do we do that? Uh, we give out grants, which is what I'm gonna talk about today. We also have exhibitions, we host symposiums and convenings, and we also have a number of special initiatives. Oh, this is not, there we go, ha ha. That's what that says, basically, <laughs> in short. Okay, so as Michael was saying, we were founded uh, on the recommendation of the Keynes Report, which was an initiative of Handmade in America, which was uh, an organization that really focused on economic development and craft, and there had an education committee which said, hey, we actually really need an organization that focuses on craft and higher education in the same way that we focus on craft and economic development, and that is really the kind of impetus behind which we were formed. Now we're going too fast. Well, we'll just go there. So we're located in Asheville, North Carolina, and this is a picture of our home. And I did want to mention that um, we are in the midst of a renovation project. So if you're coming through Asheville right now, we are not open to the public, but we'll be reopening in November. Get back to where I was. And my This is my first time using my iPad is my note, so. Da, da, da. Yep, located in Asheville. So the idea for our building renovation, we're expanding our gallery space, we're adding a co-working area, but what we really view ourselves is this like little incubator for national ideas where we can test new ideas and then put them out on the field. And also in a day and age where there are a number of craft museums closing, it's really like place and space for craft is actually really important. So uh, that's what we're doing is really providing a platform where we can test out new ideas um, in, and incubate them for, for the craft field. Um, and I just want to say from a personal note, I know like academia and education can sound really far out there. Uh, I actually trained as a jeweler and the way that the Center for Craft really touched my life was in that fact that when I was going to school and maybe a number of you are in school now and can identify with this experience, but you know, when I had to take all these required art history courses, they all taught me about the history of painting and sculpture and photography and all that great stuff but I never learned the history of jewelry or body adornment or decorative art history or any of the things that really related to the work that I was making. And that is exactly the space that the center wants to step into and help support in terms of research. And so uh, we've done projects like Publish Makers, uh, um, which is the first textbook for American studio craft history. Uh, we helped launch the first masters in studio, uh, masters in uh, critical and historical craft studies at Warren Wilson College. So we're really, really active in that field as well. However, today what I'm talking about is our grant making program, and we've been giving out grants since 2005. And uh, we've awarded over to 300 people. We've given out over $2.3 million in grants. Over a million of that has gone specifically to emerging craft artists. Uh, we have partners and have given awards in over 35 states and have 180 institutions that we've partnered with as part of our awards program. So I mentioned that our grants are really focused in three areas, makers, curators, and scholars. And today I'm really gonna focus in particularly on the makers. And maybe some of you have heard of this program called the Wingate Fellowship Program. So the Wingate Fellowship is one of our signature award programs. It's been going on since 2006. And what it is is an award of $15,000 to 10 graduating undergraduate seniors uh, from colleges across the country who have nominated two students. So um, we have a network of universities and colleges that we work with. If you're 
at those universities. You can apply to be a part of our network, and if that's something you're interested in, come talk to me after this so that we can get you in that application project. If you're a student, ask your teachers if you're part of the Wingate Fellowship Program with the Center for Crafts so that you can be eligible for these kind of nomination opportunities. So it is one of the largest award grants. Um, that's given out to makers at such an early stage. That was actually a really important value when we started this program. We really felt like when students leave school, they are leaving both their community and their networks and also, you know, the studios that they've had access to. And how do we support um, emerging talent at such a critical stage in their career to go out and continue to make the work that they're making? So many of uh, the students that receive these awards will use the funds to buy tools, to set up a studio, to take workshops, attend residencies, and travel to international museums, conferences, and exhibitions. Um, like I mentioned before, we do have over 130 schools who nominate students for this fellowship each year. And um, at the end of this, I'll show a slide with all the deadlines and you know, all the really uh, intricate information. But I do think it's interesting to point out um, that the nomination process does happen differently at every school. There are some schools who uh, have a nominations committee where all the fac all the students apply and a sort of committee of faculty choose the two students to nominate. There are schools who embed the grant program actually in their professional practices classes and so they have all of their students practice writing this grant as part of their own professional development and then they select two to put forward into the nomination processes and other schools are do it much more informally. So we see it across the board, every school handles it differently. Um, but it is really cool to see how this grant program, you know, even for the people not awarded, it becomes a really a important part of your career. And I can say I was actually nominated to be a Wingate Fellow and I didn't receive the award. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me because it made me articulate what I wanted to actually do with my career after college. And so that's the kind of professional development that I think we can um, help support through this grant. I'm going to talk about three awardees that we have recently funded, all in the 2017 class. So they've actually completed their fellowship time, which is a 12 to 18 month grant period. Um, so Brianna Hendricks, just so you get an idea of the kind of range of things that people do with this award, graduated from SUNY New Paltz in 2017. This is actually an image from her, M or her BFA thesis show. And during her fellowship, she really sought to hone her authentic artistic voice through workshops and travel. So she took workshops at Haystack, Aramont. She traveled to Jamaica to the Good Hope Plantation where she met with many of the mentors that she had been looking up to for a long time, taking a workshop there. She did an internship with the Women's Studio Workshop in upstate New York, making ceramic bowls for their chili fundraiser. She became a fall a uh, resident at Watershed Center for Ceramic Arts. And uh, at the end of her fellowship, she created a new body of work, including a series of uh, vases and vessels that were inspired by traditional African masks, Italian Mayalica imagery and patterns influenced by Neolithic Yangshao pottery. So it's really amazing to see the breadth of thing that, of you know activities that people have been able to do in just such a short period of time. Rosa Novak is a graduate of the California College of Arts, and her goal was to research soil and clay geography of California in order to contextualize her own work by using local clays within the state's craft traditions. She ended up hosting a week-long making assembly at the Center for Land Use Interpretations Desert Research Station. She worked with two soil scientists at the Department of Earth and Planetary Science at UC Berkeley in order to research clay deposits in Oakland, California. She attended the Open Engagement Conference in Queens and then founded an artist collective focused on sustainable ceramic use in Oakland called Mutual Stores. Um, and then the third artist that I want to talk about is Audrey Ann who graduated from Alfred in 2017. She used her fellowship to explore digital fabrication. She was much more interested in developing like skills and mold making techniques. She did travel to 
uh, Jing de Zhen, China for a research trip. She took classes with Del Hero at Colorado State, and then she did workshops at Peters Valley and Anderson Ranch before applying for her MFA. So that kind of gives you um, a really good sense of the breadth of things that people do. Some people really want to work on their technical skills, finding their artistic voice, and others, you know, go on to form collectives and, and really enhance their own uh, studio practice. Um, I'm actually going to skip. We love them, but I'm going to skip on to this slide, which is to say uh, this program has been running for over 13 years now, and it was actually just endowed by the Wingate Foundation, something that we're so proud of and so excited to be able to continually offer this program in, in, perpetu in perpetuity. And so what that allows us to do now is think, great, how can we now reinvest in the people who have already received this award and build this into a network that's not just a cash award, but becomes something that um, once fellows are, you know, in invited into this community, it becomes a community for life. And so we've started the Wingate Connect, which is an annual uh, convening of all the Wingate Fellows so that they can meet, share professional development, workshops, um, meet each other and network, and really start to form the bonds that can last them into the future. This is that nitty gritty thing that I said I was gonna show you. Uh, so the award amounts, uh, it is now a 12 month grant award. Uh, in general, we open the nomination process in November and um, <laughs> that's all right. Uh, and then we have a February deadline and we'll actually just got done awarding our last round of Wingate Fellows this past year or this past month and we'll be announcing them this May. So this is, you know, the last, the previous year award, but it does follow the same cycle every year so that you can kind of get a sense of what's coming up next. So that's the Wingate Fellowship. I now want to talk to you um, about a newish grant program. It's a bit more experimental, and it's uh, open to all applicants who wish to apply. And this is called the Materials Based Research Grant. Do a time check. We're doing good. So the Materials Based Research Grant uh, was something that was started in 2017, so it's a relatively new award. Um, for this, though, makers apply actually in partnership with STEM researchers. So uh, it's a collaborative application process. And the goal of the grant is really to encourage mutually beneficial research and craft. So it's really, it's not just like, what can the sciences do for us? Or like, how can craft help the sciences? But what is that dialogue that's formed between craft? What can we offer and what can we receive in return and build new research pathways? So it's also about fostering innovation, exploring the interrelationship between craft and the STEM fields, and it's also about exploring the application of craft and craft skills outside of the field of art. What is the relevance of craft in this you know, discipl cross-disciplinary context, and how do we start to kind of fund and encourage research in those areas? Um, you may be wondering, what is materials-based research? Because this is a term that really gets thrown around a lot, and it can mean a lot of different things. And so uh, I recognize that there is a lot of confusion around what materials-based research is. For us and for this grant, the way that we have defined it, um, this is sort of a continuum or scale of materials-based research, right? Where on uh, the one end, you have this sort of uh, arms race for new materials. This is like a very science-heavy field where scientists sit in labs and they try and find like the blackest black or the bounciest bounce. And you know, really, you know, there's like material science programs, right, that you can go to. And that's really one end of the spectrum of materials based research. On the other end of the spectrum is really how new materials that have been discovered get applied. And so this is a lot of times it's like the innovation happens in the laboratory and then it gets passed on to the designers and the craftspeople and they're trying to figure out, well, how can we actually just apply that in, in our research and in our art products and in our design products? Um, that would be this other end of the spectrum. 
What we're really interested in is this middle area of the spectrum where the laboratory and the studio get combined as one and where research and development happens in tandem with the craftsperson and the material scientists, right? And so it's really this interesting collaboration asking like, what does a craftsperson do when you put them in a science laboratory? Like what new questions do they ask? How do they approach research that could open up new questions in the fields of science and technology and mathematics that they weren't even, didn't even know to ask, right? Like that it sounds like a really interesting space to explore. So when we talk about materials-based research, it's really about that give and take, that mutually beneficial relationship that can be formed between art and science. Um, so that also goes into who can apply, and I did mention it is teams of researchers, and we ask for uh, one lead collaborator to be in the field of craft, and the other to be in uh, either science or technology, mathematics. Um, we ask that each lead collaborator be a professional in their given field, whatever that means in their field. So this is very kind of open-ended. Um, could be an academic, could be... Uh, a scientist in an industry, it could be a full-time maker, or any other skilled specialist, as long as they hold the training and skills to uh, complete their proposal. Uh, I am gonna briefly talk about one of our recent uh, materials-based research recipients in the ceramics field, and that's Greg Moore and Tobias Lamberg. And both of them were at Arcadia University. Their project was for the effects of farming practices and animal husbandry on the material properties of bone china. And uh, <laughs> this is a super exciting project. And uh, maybe I think Greg was talking last year at one of the Nsikas about this a little bit, so hopefully some people are nodding their heads. So this could be a project you're familiar with. But in essence, they're looking at that relationship between, because bone china is made of an organic material, that means that there's this whole ecosystem that informs that organic material. What the cattle was fed, how they were raised, were they you know, confined in farms or out in the fields, like happy cows, and so they've taken all these different sam bone samples and um, run a number of tests. Tobias is a biologist by training, and so he's looking at the sort of little, like the actual chemical makeup of the different bone properties, and then how that informs the quality of the bone china that's produced. Um, in terms of applying for materials-based research, the 2019 deadline did just pass, but we will have a new round that opens up again in November. Uh, so if that's something you're interested in, because it is a collaborative proposal, it does take uh, a lot of lead time, actually, in order to kind of build up momentum into the grant process, and we totally get that and support you starting your applications early. You know, it's really important that I think uh, the collaborators have a relationship before they're going into this proposal because it means that they've already um, built that relationship and trust that a good collaboration is based off of. Okay, so. Um, really brief plug, we do give other uh, grants to curators and scholars. Uh, our, re our curatorial fellowship program supports emerging curators and actually uh, one of their shows is up at the M, which is in St. Paul, The Good Making of Good Things. Uh, it originally opened in Asheville and has traveled to a number of different locations, so perhaps if you saw that, you got to see kind of one of the applications of our funding there. We also uh, fund scholarship through the Craft Research Fund program, which has funded a number of publications and exhibitions and conferences. And I want to end, because I'm super excited about this for a number of years, the Craft Research Fund program is one of our longest running programs. It's been going on since 2005. And it's really been focused on supporting curators and scholars. But one of the things that we've 
want to acknowledge is that artists are researchers too, and their practice is a part of research. And so we're actually gonna be adding a Craft Research Fund Artist Fellowship to our series of artist programs, or our grant programs. It's gonna be officially announced in June, so this is like a little teaser, and you're probably gonna have the most questions about this, and I'm gonna have the least amount of answers. Um, but it is gonna be an award open to individual artists to support artist-driven research. And we really want to expand our definition of research, acknowledge that there isn't, you know, a lot of artists who are out there doing research on their own, and uh, hope to be a support system for that. Okay. Like I said, I just want to again say, if you have any questions, our website's a great resource. The sheet that's been passed around will sign you up for our e-news. That's a great resource. Um, and I'm just going to open it up for questions that you all may have. I've been told that there's a microphone here um, that would be really helpful if you all use to, for the recording purposes. So thank you. Um, the answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, no, it's a really good question. The question was, how do we define research? and Or how do we define craft? How do we define craft? Okay, we do have um, an institutional definition of craft, and you can find that on our website. But I'm just going to give you... Um, maybe the provocative answer, which is to say that as an organization who really supports the field and the thinking and critical dialogue within the field, what we really want to support is you all defining craft. So a lot of times when people ask me if their application is craft, what I'll say is, in your application, you need to explicitly make the, de like the argument for why this is craft. Um, because the, the definition of craft is always changing, and you all are the one that's moving the ball, right? You're always kind of moving it, the dialogue's changing, and so to just box anything in, I think would be um, a little short-sighted, actually. The question is, if the new grant is directed towards students, it is gonna be open to all artists. Our kind of idea was to create a mid-career grant, um, which is a kind of time period, broadly defined time period, uh, when artists are looking for resources to sort of take their practice to the next level or do that project that you really haven't had the resources to do. Define curator. Um, we support all types of curators, independent curators, um, Curators uh, tend to be people who are putting an exhibition together, who are, you know, using objects or to tell a sort of story about what they see happening in the field, a trend or a history or, um, does that answer your question? I'm not really, another question about um, the curators and, and where to find more information on that. So yeah, we support curators in two different areas. We support um, all curators through our craft research fund who are doing research towards a future exhibition. And those resources are really about supporting the kind of lead up research that goes into an exhibition. And you can definitely find more information about that on our website. The Curatorial Fellowship Program is specifically to support emerging curators in the field. So people who um, either haven't held an institutional position or um, maybe an artist looking to learn about the curatorial field as a new space for them to move their practice into. Um, and there is also more information on the website about that. Um, that is a great question, and it was, if for an artist outside of a university setting, how might they go about uh, contacting a scientist, I mean, to, for the materials-based research grant? I think it really depends, and um, we have given out awards that are outside of the university system, although I will acknowledge that there is a distinct advantage to working, you know, for this grant um, of already having that connection. Um, and... If you're interested in that, I would actually be happy to connect you with one of our grant recipients to talk about how they go about it. I mean, some of them are personal connections. Some people really do kind of cold call people or ask for introductions. Um, it's certainly not a perfect, you know, it is like the, a good intention that we acknowledge that it's not the most perfect um, 
process because there are gonna be areas and blind spots and that sort of thing and we're willing to try and help as best that we can for artists that are interested in that. It's actually one of the, the program development things that I've been thinking about a lot. So thank you for your question. And I'm sorry, can we take one more since she was up here? No. You're telling me no, Phoenix. Okay. I'm sorry. I'll do it later. We'll talk outside. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.